Bible trails The Son of God He is near He chose to walk with us These tribal trails Welcome to Tribal Trails. We are filming here in Ontario and we have some beautiful guests today and his name is Thomas B. Moore and his wife Jane. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today and uh, Thomas tell me a little bit about Moosonee. For those of you that don't know where Moosonee and Moose Factory is, mm -hmm. uh, it's situated at the southern tip of James Bay seven miles up the Moose River. Now the Moose River is a a big river. It's about 60 miles long, and that Moosonee Moose Factory is five miles wide. And Moose, Moosonee is on the mainland, and Moose Factory is on the uh, is an island where the and the reserve is on the island, and and uh, that's where I I grew up in Moosonee. And uh, when I was about six years old. I attended school and my sisters had a terrible job getting me to school. I didn't want to go to school. And they dragged me, the both of them, all the way to the school and I grabbed a hold of everything and the clothesline, everything was coming behind me. <laughs> Eventually I got to the school and the teacher was standing there. He gave me a quarter to go to school. <laughs> and then uh, I walked into school, I looked over in the corner and I seen this beautiful young lady standing in the oh. corner all by herself. <laughs> I walked up to her. She couldn't speak a word of English. Grade one. Yeah. yeah. So I said to her, Kisaka Egan, which means I love you. Kiwi Gamana, will you marry me? <laughs> Grade one. <laughs> and so we were, we were married uh, 15 years later. Oh. 19, 1960, we were married. But uh, when I was going to public school, uh, the first year was pretty rough. I lost my dad. He uh, he drowned in the Moose River at nighttime in a boating accident. Him and two uh, two of his other friends, the boat flipped over and they both drowned. There was three. One made it to the island. He spent the night on the island. So the next thing I remember was they came to get me at school and tell me that they were looking for my dad. So I was standing, I remember standing on the bank looking out across the river. And, uh, and then the next thing I remember was, uh, we were in this old building behind the parish hall. And it was dark in there. The only light, there was a small window and the light was coming in the cracks in the walls. And uh, there were three bodies on the floor. Three women were crying, rocking back and forth. And one of them happened to be my mother. And my, my uncle said, go and kiss your dad goodbye. So I, I went over and I kissed my dad goodbye. No, my mother had to raise uh, seven children, seven of us, with no income, you know. And, and it was tough. Uh, there must have been times I was cold. I don't remember. And at times I was hungry, I don't remember. But she, my mother uh, was a strong church-going woman. Uh, she made sure that we went to Sunday school. We, we were, uh, in those days there were only two churches in the, oh. in the Moose Knee and Moose Factory, mm -hmm. Catholic and Anglican. So you were in either a Catholic or an Anglican. Okay. And uh, my mother was, uh, uh, I was confirmed and married in the Anglican church. I was brought up in the Anglican religion. Okay. And my mother used to tell us she, uh, if we didn't dress up, she liked to dress up and take us to church. If we didn't dress up, the crow would do you, you know what on you. So <laughs> we had to. <laughs> but, uh, I was also an altar boy. At the, at the age of 10, I was an altar boy in the Anglican church. And uh, the, uh, I said we got married in 1960, and the Lord has blessed us with three children, seven grandchildren and 16 grandchildren, which we, 
16? I get mixed up. <laughs> Great grandchildren, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we love and adore very much. And I'm, one of my son, my son is a preacher at the Sudbury First Nations here in Sudbury. His name is Kevin Moore? Yeah, Kevin Moore. Yeah, okay. And if the Lord willing, on October the 7th this year, we'll have been married 58 years. Abraham, he told his nephew, this is how it's going to be. I'll take the land that you don't want, and that's good enough for me. Well, it's good enough, good enough. It's everything I need. I know God is watching over things, and that's good enough for me. I know some people live in mansions while others live on dreams. I'm somewhere in the middle and that's good enough for me. Though my wallet's always empty, it seems like nothing comes for free. But I'll be rich in heaven and that's good enough for me. Well, it's good enough, good enough. It's everything I need. I know God is watching over things and that's good enough for me. Good enough, good enough, it's everything I need. I know God is watching over things, and that's good enough for me. Well, it's good enough. Yes, it's good enough for me. Well, it's good enough. God is watching over me. Friends, I'd like to tell you I've got everything I need. God is watching over things, and that's for me if you're young like shepherd david or old like abraham you can put your trust in god and praise him like i am and that's good enough good enough it's everything i need i know god is watching over things and that's good enough for me i know god is watching over things and that's good Enough for me. In 1991, it's when we were hit with a big storm came into my life, and it came in the, in the form of a life-threatening illness, cancer. Jane told me, Hurricane Tom, she says. <laughs> At the time, I was playing hockey in a tournament in Cocker, 186 miles south of Moose Knee. I was showing the guys in the dressing room how big my left arm was getting. When I got back home to Moose Knee, Jane measured my arm. It was uh, two and a half inches bigger than my right arm. And later on, I happened to be visiting my mother in the hospital at Moose Factory when this doctor walked in, Dr. Wolf. He was a good friend of mine. I took him hunting many times. And I told him, Dr. Wolf, there's a lump in my arm. So he took a, made me take off my shirt and he felt it and he said, yep, there's a lump there. I'm pretty sure it's a cyst. Oh. So the next day he told me to come back the next day. So I went back the next day and the ultrasound, it showed up on the ultrasound. It was about four centimeters by six centimeters. And he still, uh, Dr. Wolf still insisted it was a cyst. But 10 days later, the biopsy came back. And I had an appointment at the clinic, Moosini. So I went to the appointment and the nurse couldn't find the, the records. So I told her, I'll go home and you can call me. I'll make an appointment for next week. So I went home. As soon as I got home, the phone rang. She said, we found your results of your exercise. Uh, I told her, I'll make an appointment to come next week. She says, no, I think you better come right now. So I went to the clinic and uh, she says, what you have is cancer, a very rare type of cancer. And uh, I would have to go to Kingston. 
And things to happen, seem to move so suddenly and quickly at the time, you know. January the 15th, I was in a hockey tournament and three months later I had no left arm. On a, and when I went to the clinic, it was on a Wednesday, we found this arm. Arm was cancer. On a Thursday, I was flown to Kingston, which is a thousand miles from Moussigny, and admitted to the Kingston General Hospital. Jane came along with me on the plane. On Friday, I was given a bone scan. There was nothing on Saturday. But on Sunday afternoon, my wife and daughter were visiting me in the hospital, my daughter Debbie. When the doctor walked in, he pulls up this chair, and he held back nothing. He told me what I had was a high-grade cancerous tumor, which is life-threatening. Our first priority is to try to save your life. During the process, you may lose your left arm. I looked over at my wife. She was staring straight ahead. My daughter was in tears. My first reaction was one of anger. Why me, Lord? To make a long story short, Jane had to go back to work in Moussigny. And I was to spend the next three months or so in Kingston, undergoing various tests and 25 treatments of radiation. And this was a very lonely and scary time for me because I'm alone a thousand miles from home. But one night, the phone rang. It was my good friend, Mervyn Chichu. No. Yeah. Mervyn at the time must have been the pastor at the Cree Gospel Capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, pastor, we talked for a while and then he spoke to me about Psalm 46. Oh, okay. The Lord is my refuge and my strength. I used to say that Psalm many times over and over. The Lord is my refuge and my strength. Psalm 46 has helped me tremendously in my road to recovery. So I say you miigwech, Mervyn. Thank you, Mervyn. Now Psalm 46 has helped me through some... The psalmist must have... Uh, who wrote the psalm must have been going through a very stressful time in his life. There were times the psalmist felt like he was... Uh, must have been in a pressure cooker and couldn't get out. He wrote the words of the psalm as, as he thought to deal with the stresses that life sometimes throws at you. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. It's almost as if the psalmist were talking, of, talking today about me, especially with all the disasters happening all over the world. Now I'd like to talk about a couple of changes that happened in my life. First of all, over the past years, after losing my arm, I've had to contend with a terrible struggle, making adjustments, learning to live with one arm. But the biggest change which I experienced came about me spiritually. I mentioned many times over the years how the Lord speaks to me maybe a night in my dreams, when I'm alone in the quietness, sometimes through a preacher who's talking. I was walking away from the Lord, and, but I found out that no matter how many steps you walk away from God, it only takes one to get back to Him. Now one time, after returning home from the hospital, I found myself sitting alone in my bedroom at home. Uh, and the tears started to come. Just like a dam break, breaking. They just wouldn't stop. Jane heard me and she came in and put her arms around me and uh, tried to come for me. I didn't know how I was going to carry on in life. But uh, shortly after that, I think we heard of the uh, Reverend Ken Antone was preaching at Moose Factory at the Cree Gospel Chapel. Mm -hmm. So Jane and I decided to go over to the, to the service. And uh, Mervyn, I think, was a, was a pastor there at the time. And uh, 
I don't know, I was sitting there and something just stirred in me, you know. I didn't plan on anything. Like, at the end of the service, he had this altar call, you know, and I, I found myself at the front all of a sudden, you know, like I hadn't planned on it, and I just went up, and I, I found myself sitting at the feet of Jesus, as I suppose the hymn goes, eh? I publicly accepted the Lord that day, and after that, my life began to change. I guess I was raised in Moosonee, but I was born in a place called English River. Okay. Uh, we didn't move to Moosonee until I was about seven or eight, so I started school late. Yeah. And my English helped, I mean, my Cree held me back, of course. Yes. So, um, it was all, we spoke nothing but Cree at home. Yeah. My mother couldn't speak English, my dad could. But uh, that's beautiful. My mom, my mom spoke Cree in the home, too. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up, there wasn't, we didn't really have a preacher in Musini at that time, like, you know, off and on. He would, so we didn't have no Sunday school, so never really had a chance to learn about the Bible and that. And, and I don't even know if we had Cree Bible at home. But I remember my mother always reading her, her hymn book and singing hymns oh. in Cree. Okay. Yeah. So, but then... I guess with me, I guess I accepted the Lord in 1989 at Moose Factory. There were there was a, an evangelist that came from the states, mm -hmm. and that was uh, March March the 13th, 1989. So was that Antone? No. Yeah, but you remember accepting the Lord? Yeah. yeah. 
before you were married? No. No, that was after. That was after you were married. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After he accepted the Lord or before? No, I accepted the Lord first. You accept yeah. the Lord first. Mm -hmm. My favorite is uh, uh, Psalm 23, oh. but in Cree. Oh, okay. When, when my brother was dying, he kept asking me to read this Psalm 20. He kept saying Psalm 23, Psalm 23. So every day I had to read Psalm 23, but in English. And then when my sister passed away, I didn't know what to do for her because everybody else was doing different things at the funeral. And I, I decided to read the 23rd Psalm in Cree. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's been every day, like I, know, I memorized the whole, the whole. Can, can you say it for me, mm -hmm. for us? Yeah. It sure <clears throat> would be wonderful. Okay. The bell is again, the man is done, and she will leave. The bell is again, the bell is again, and 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 the bell is again, that's beautiful. <laughs> yes, that's so beautiful. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you do the Lord's Prayer too? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's yeah. hear the Lord's Prayer. No time in Angus Kishokaitain, the biggest touch got daggers in Catherine. Get to go on, get to the Chibolo. Get tell them when the weed rejigga del would ask if that was good to get you. Meal and Anna Noskagishka go to Matsiak. We'll bet on one and one to your nana. A shoe a belt of Mogachik and a gay. Go on to the meal mystic. A gavilla magazine of Saint Anne Gashiko get you yak. Me tagger moon and magamajiga gonna. With a gilag at the blue scene. Beautiful, very beautiful. I can understand. I, my mother's Cree. And yeah, I'm Cree. Yeah, okay. I've learned that. But mm -hmm. a lot of what you say, mm -hmm. yeah, I can understand that. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. words that are quite similar. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jane, when, when he was diagnosed with cancer and uh, how did how did the Lord take you through that? Uh, I didn't know what to think when he when he came home. Yeah. I I guess I was at work when he when he went for, to see the doctor. Mm -hmm. When I come home and he said, "It's cancer," mm -hmm. and I I said, "What?" And then he said, "Cancer." I just went numb from head to toe. Yeah, and then I guess I must have prayed all night. Praying yeah. for him, you know, mm -hmm. wondering what to do and what's going to happen. What... Yeah. How did the Lord help you through that? Attending church and talking to Christ Christian friends, and so suffering is part of part of life. Suffering is part of life. It is, yeah. Yeah, but, uh... and th there's no way we can get away from it. Mm -hmm. It comes in one way or another, and. Uh, Cancer is very common today. It is. You know, it's sad to say that it touches almost every family. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, Thomas, people are watching, you know, and some of them are suffering from cancer. Mm -hmm. Is there a word of uh, encouragement that you can give to them? The cancer I had, you know, it was a very rare type, and the, the, the doctor never told me at the time until a couple of years later I happened to run into him and he told me he never expected me to pull through, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that was 27 years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, today I have to live with a lot of pain, a lot of phantom pain, and there, there's nothing they can do about the phantom pain. It just uh, have to live with it. And I do a lot of praying and uh, I know when my mother passed away, I went to visit her at the hospital, and she was in a lot of pain when she was passed away. And uh, so I prayed hard for her, 
You know, I'm, I prayed for the Lord to help her with her pain. And he took her home. Oh, uh, that was the way of the Lord had, the only way that the Lord could deal with her pain at the time. Yes, pain and suffering are a real part of life. And there is no real way to prepare for them. They hit us like an ambush. Jane shared how she didn't know how to react except by going to church and praying with friends. And yet that did not take the cancer away from Thomas. Thomas had his arm cut off, and yet he still deals with the pain. Life certainly isn't fair, so what can we do about it? Sometimes all we can do is trust God who is in control, and he can work it all out for his glory. We have a booklet that we would like you to have. It's called Out of the Ashes. It's about Job's dealings with his suffering even though he didn't deserve it. Just give us a call and we'll send it to you. I believe there's hope for me and I'll hang on somehow. He's faithful. Very felt so helpless in all my life so many nights I suffered so much pain and strife a million doubts assailed me but God won't break his vow I believe in Jesus, and he will not fail me now. I know he will not fail me now. There are some things he will not allow. Yes, I know he will 